Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Archive Insights. So last week there was a really cool event in the AI community. OpenAI 5, a system of five neural networks built by a nonprofit organization, OpenAI took on a team of five professional gamers in the very complicated game of Dota 2. So the match consisted of three games. The first two were normal draft games, giving each side equal chances of winning. And after relatively short game times, OpenAI 5 was able to convincingly beat Team Human. It's trying to see if he can maybe set up for the Red Grim. They'll jump in again. Fox instantly gets hexed by oh, no. the Lion. Blitz now getting focused, the Assassinate bringing him low, there's the Blast from the Lich to finish him off. Four dead on Team Human as OpenAI open the base up for a second set of racks and GG will be called 21 minutes in into this benchmark. OpenAI will take game one. I, I mean, I wasn't that... But then the second game was a little bit different since the live audience on Twitch was allowed to choose the heroes to be played by the bot, resulting in very unbalanced teams and an estimated win probability of OpenAI 5 of only 2.9%. And, oh, wait, so that, they, yes. OpenAI says there's a 2.9% yes. chance that OpenAI is going to win. Yeah, they think they wow, are. they're scared. Let's draft that them. is, I mean, well then everybody, you guys have done it here. And as such, Game 3 was a clear victory for Team Human. But surely will not be enough to save OpenAI here in this Game 3. As they're taking it home, Team Human will be able to find a victory here. And now many people are probably wondering why would a world-class research organization like OpenAI spend so much time and effort trying to build an AI that can play simple video games. The reality, however, is that it has become commonplace in the AI community to test the progress of deep reinforcement learning algorithms on a wide variety of games because they provide a perfect test bed for measuring the progress of ever more complicated AI systems. And while for unexperienced gamers these games might seem trivial and uninteresting, they can actually pose surprisingly difficult challenges for current AI systems and therefore provide the ideal training grounds for measuring and building progress in the field. And additionally, as is very common in machine learning land, I've seen a wide range of opinions covering OpenAI 5. I mean, really, I've seen everything from Elon Musk's trash-talking Dota bots that spank top-tier humans, all the way to machine learning researchers that are claiming that this doesn't provide any useful knowledge for the community, since these bots are simply overfitting to an endless amount of training data. So because of all that, in this episode, I want to systematically dismantle the OpenAI 5 system, starting from a general overview of what this means for the progress of AI research, all the way to the specific implementation details and the compute resources that were used to train OpenAI 5. And then in part two of this episode, which will be a different video, I will dive into all the technical details of the reinforcement learning algorithm behind OpenAI 5, which is called proximal policy optimization. I hope you're ready to dive in deep. My name is Xander, and welcome to Archive Insights. So after the successes of deep reinforcement learning in benchmarks like Atari and Go, it was time to move on to even bigger problems. And a game like Dota 2 definitely has a lot of these. Now to get a sense of why these games are so difficult for reinforcement learning, I really suggest to check out my video on sparse rewards in case you haven't seen it yet. So one of the major challenges in a game like Dota is that an agent has to take thousands of actions, you know, moving around by clicking the screen, casting abilities, buying items, and very often the payback or the reward for those actions only arrives much later in the game. And on top of that, the output action space in Dota 2 is incredibly large if you compare it with a game like Atari, for example, that only has a couple of discrete outputs, or a game like Go that is played on a discrete 19 by 19 grid. In comparison, in Dota 2, you have to click the map anywhere to move around. You can cast abilities, you have to farm creeps, attack towers. You know, there's a ton of different things that you have to do in that output space in order to be successful at the game. And this has been notoriously difficult for AI systems to learn. And then finally, Dota 2 is also what we call an imperfect information game, which means that at any given point, you don't have access to all the information of the current game state. So for example, in Dota 2, you have something that's called the fog of war, which means that if an enemy is really far away from you or they're hiding in the forest, then you can't see them. But becoming really, really good at the game actually requires you to learn how to model their behavior and their positions, even though you don't have any labels to train on. 
And so all these things combined make for the fact that while Dota 2 is just a simple video game, it actually presents a lot of challenging problems for the current AI systems that we have today. In fact, that's exactly the reason why it was chosen as a benchmark to test the progress in deep reinforcement learning. And we also know that simultaneously Google DeepMind is in fact working on StarCraft 2, so I hope we're going to get to see some results from that pretty soon. Now to get a sense of OpenAI's victory against Team Human, consider that all five professional players were what they call in the 99.95th percentile of the Dota 2 rankings. This means that if you were to pick 10,000 Dota players at random and rank them according to their skill, then these pros would be ranked fifth out of 10,000. So in other words, these guys are really, really good. All right, so how is machine learning even able to play a game as complex as Dota 2? Well, the answer is the combination of a reinforcement learning algorithm called proximal policy optimization that I will cover in the next video and a self-play strategy that is combined with a lot of computational resources. So the fact that the system learns through self-play means that you can install the game engine on many computers and then have the algorithm learn by playing a ton of matches against itself, gradually getting better. And I really mean a ton of matches. To be precise, OpenAI 5 plays about 180 years of game experience every single day. And it does this using a scale up version of proximal policy optimization that's running on, hold on to your chairs, 128,000 CPUs and 256 of the biggest GPUs available. And even in deep learning land, that is a lot of compute. And now if you're wondering how much all of that would cost, I was actually quite surprised to discover that with today's massive cloud infrastructure, those things are actually quite affordable, topping out at about $2,500 per hour using preemptable virtual machines in the Google Cloud Platform. And yes, that is a lot of money for us individuals, but not if you're a world-class research organization that is backed by millionaires like Elon Musk, Sam Altman, Peter Thiel, and many others. And now before we dive into some specific implementation details of OpenAI 5, I want to spend a few minutes on why this victory matters and what it means for the future of AI. So first of all, I think what we've learned from this is that while the current reinforcement learning algorithms that we have are vastly simpler and less capable than our human intellect, if you give them enough training data and compute resources, they can actually solve surprisingly complex problems. In fact, as we've similarly seen from the AlphaGo story, the engineering challenge of scaling these deep RL pipelines to massive scales seems to be equally important when compared to the algorithms that drive these systems. But on the other hand, I also think we should be very careful not to overstate these achievements in terms of AI progress. As François Collet, the creator of Keras, very accurately puts it in this tweet, any problem can be treated as a pattern recognition problem if your training data covers a sufficiently dense sampling of the problem space. What's interesting, however, is what happens when your training data is a sparse sampling of the space. Because to extrapolate, you will need intelligence. And clearly, training 180 years worth of experience every single day seems like a rather dense sampling of the problem space. So in a sense, you could say that the OpenAI 5 system has successfully learned to overfit on a very dense sampling of the Dota 2 problem space. But undeniably, this has also allowed it to beat a team of professional gamers, showing that while these systems might be doing nothing more than just overfitting, they can in fact be used to create practical systems that can tackle complex problems. But because all these innovations live in the open source atmosphere that surrounds the machine learning community, it's quite likely that these will open up a lot of new applications in fields like finite element methods, for example. So if you think about molecular simulations or fluid dynamics, I'm pretty sure that deep reinforcement learning can open up a way to drastically redefine the traditional engineering process. You know, think new antibiotics, better nanomaterials, optimized traffic flows, many, many more. But on the other hand, a lot of real world applications don't have access to these accurate simulators or massive amounts of training data. And in these cases, the current sample complexity and the lack of generalization obviously remain a crucial obstacle. And while looking at the progress over the past five years might give us some reasons to be hopeful for the future, I think we also have to admit that currently there are no fundamental solutions to these very big problems like generalization and overfitting. Okay, so now that we have a sense of surroundings, let's start picking apart how OpenAI 5 really works. So first of all, how do these bots actually see the game? Well, the implemented version of OpenAI 5 uses the Valve bot API for the Dota game. 
This means that instead of seeing the rendered game pixels that we see on the screen, the bots actually have access to the internal features of the game engine. So this includes things like hero name, uh, health, position, enemy abilities, creep scores, item actives, all of those things. And many people see this as a clear advantage that the bots have over human players, and this is probably true. But the truth is that the whole goal of this OpenAI Dota 2 challenge was to see how well these reinforcement learning algorithms can scale to very complex environments with long time horizons. And giving the bots access to the true game state doesn't actually make this job all that much easier. Here's a little piece of the discussion after the match that shows that point. About the feature, feature design, uh, ah. why not uh, image-based features? Ah, so so this, this is actually very correlated. So, so what we really want to explore in this project is how well can, 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 can this system learn to strategize in a game if you give it a lot of compute, a lot of experience. And the problem with learning from pixels is that even generating those pixels you know, requires running on a graphics card, requires running a graphics engine, and it is just expensive if you want to do it on a ton of machines, and it would just force us to use a lower scale for training. So that is our primary reason. Uh, we just don't want to spend time computing the graphics. We want to, we want to focus on the strategy, the logic. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thanks. And additionally, given enough training data, it's quite likely that a supervised learning approach using deep convolutional networks would probably be able to discover the raw game state using only raw pixels as an input. The reality is that learning to detect specific features in a visual scene or quickly reacting to an enemy ability is actually not that difficult. In fact, it's where machine learning shines. But the really hard task is to learn sophisticated plans over long time horizons in complex environments like Dota 2. All right, so the bot has access to the internal features of the game engine. Now, it's quite likely that they're occasionally adding new features, but in the June 25th blog post of OpenAI, they mentioned that the bot sees the world through a list of 20,000 numbers. And according to the updated network diagram of the August 6th system, they add a 10 by 10 minimap, which has a couple of uh, channels for vision, walkability, creep and ward locations, and which gets processed by a small convolutional network. And then finally, all these features are concatenated and passed on to a single layer LSTM cell that parses the inputs and emits actions through several possible action heads. And in the initial blog post, OpenAI mentioned that the LSTM had a hidden state size of 1024 values, but this was scaled up to 2048 in the latest version. And now let's take a look at the reward function, which is another fundamental difference with the AlphaGo system, for example. So while AlphaGo had a very simple binary feedback bit at the end of the game for either winning or losing, the OpenAI 5 reward function was heavily, heavily shaped by people who know a lot about the Dota 2 game and who understand the optimization algorithm. So here, for example, we can see that many sub-goals in the game, like farming creeps, killing enemy heroes, destroying buildings, all have their own hard-coded rewards. So obviously, this makes it a lot easier for the agent to discover successful behavior. And another major difference with the AlphaGo system is that OpenAI 5 doesn't use any kind of Monte Carlo unrolls. So it simply picks the top action from its policy network based on the current LSTM state. And the reason is, of course, because it's impossible to do rollouts in a game like Dota 2, but I think it's interesting to recall how big of a difference that Monte Carlo rollout actually made in the AlphaGo system. And apart from all this reward shaping, OpenAI 5 also uses hard-coded item builds and skill leveling orders. Although OpenAI mentioned that they were experimenting with having the bots learn this from scratch as well. And then finally, I'd like to end with a few things that I found really interesting when watching the live matches. So first of all, I think a lot of people, including myself, were very surprised by how heavily influenced the win rates were by the hero draft. And according to the OpenAI blog post, in late June, they added a win probability output to the neural network to retrospect what AI5 was predicting. And when they later considered drafting, they realized that they could use this to evaluate the win probability of any draft. Simply look at the prediction on the first frame of a game and use that one to make a tree that you can then use search on. And I'm guessing that this could become a very interesting feature for professional gamers during draft picks. And then a lot of people were also noticing that the bots were sometimes warding in very strange places. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because how would you design a reward function for placing wards? I mean, it's not that simple. Instead, the OpenAI team decided they would just add in the ability to ward and see what the bots learn to do with that by themselves. 
And then I'm wondering if some people notice this, but in some of the games you can actually see the bots quickly peeking inside the Roshan pit and then going back out. And according to the OpenAI engineers, this is actually an artifact from the randomizations that were used for training the system. So as it turns out, killing a very strong neutral monster like Roshan is almost impossible by doing random exploration because you will never end up there with five coherent uh, heroes to actually kill that monster. And so in order to incentivize the exploration in the algorithm to actually learn that Roshan is a very useful objective to take, what they did is that every training game, Roshan had a random amount of health. So sometimes when the bot was really lucky, it could encounter a Roshan that only had 100 health and was you know, able to kill it all the way by itself and get the buffs for the entire team. And this actually allowed the algorithm to learn that taking an objective like Roshan has a lot of useful reward. But as you can see, this has also left an artifact in the bot's policies to sometimes go and check if Roshan is not low health, as was sometimes the case in the training games. And then for me personally, I think the third game was actually the most, most interesting. Because in the third game, the bots were starting the game with a really, really high disadvantage. And they quickly started getting behind. And at some point, you could really see that the bots were very, very confused. They didn't really have a specific strategy for dealing with that situation of being so far behind. And so I think the reason for this is that while training through self-play, you will not often get a situation where one of the sides is losing very, very heavily because by definition, you're playing an opponent that is almost equal strength. And these guys, <laughs> maybe seeing if they can uh, join teams, swap sides. Uh, I mean, they're very confused at this point. They and so I guess this clearly proves the point by Francois Collet on densely sampling your data distribution. And so all in all, while it's definitely true that this victory doesn't imply a significant breakthrough in AI theory, I think we can all say that it was a very impressive engineering achievement. OpenAI 5 showed impeccable teamfight skills, came up with a very aggressive but successful meta, and as was the case with AlphaGo, will probably have a lot of impact on the future of Dota 2 gameplay. And so the hope is now that these achievements will trigger a whole range of new real-world applications that are combining these deep reinforcement learning systems with very accurate simulators or a lot of training data that is densely sampled from the problem space. And finally, don't forget, if you want to dive into the nuts and bolts of the algorithm behind OpenAI 5, be sure to check out the follow-up video to this episode, which will dive into proximal policy optimization. If you like this video and you want to keep learning about AI, don't forget to subscribe. My name is Xander and I thank you very much for watching Archive Insights.